people. All right, Paul, you can feel free to turn on your video whenever you're ready. We're going to start with a few opening remarks. All right, welcome to everybody in the Zoomosphere, but also on site. Hello, Paul, nice to see you. Um, I'm Maya. I'm the convener of Conversations in Contemporary Art, and we're going to start off with a few introductory protocols and getting settled in. Um, if there's anything I've learned in the past two weeks, whew, it's to just take things a bit slower and remember what it means to be embodied in space again and not doing everything via Zoom when you're wearing pajamas and can fiddle with your fingers and nobody sees. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Um, I'm doing so with support and co-hosts. I'm joined by Jobina Pednakwat, who is an artist and graduate student in the materials and fibers and materials practices concentration. And you may have been uh, coached on protocols by Pascal uh, Tetro, who is uh, also an artist and grad student in the program. Um, in charge of our snack table this evening, but also we'll be liaising with the folks joining us via Zoom. So if you have any questions, folks joining us remotely, feel free to use the Q&A function. It will be moderated by Pascal, and we will more than happy, more than happily bring your voice into the session in conversation with Paul. Um, like I said, I'm the coordinator of Conversations in Contemporary Art. Uh, I'm also an assistant professor here in the, uh, the Department of Studio Arts. And Conversations in Contemporary Art um, has been running since before my time here at Concordia, uh, since roughly 2012. And it's gone through several iterations um, and complexions. Um, and it's hosted out of the MFA program and usually constitutes a series of monthly or bi-weekly artist talks or discussions with curators, panels or discussions with cultural practitioners of various ilks. For the past two years, we have, of course, been doing this remotely via Zoom. So we are gradually pulling things back to VA114, which is where we're based, Paul. It's a cinema theater kind of space within the Studio Arts building. Um, I seem to remember it being red, but now it's blue. <laughs> Anyways, memory is, we'll be talking about memory and transmissions and obfusc obfuscations this evening. Um, but it's with this web of gathering that I also want to make some remarks in relation to territory. Um, I, uh, like I say, have been doing Sika for a couple of years now, or maybe I neglected to mention it, but it's four years. Uh, four years is almost as long as I've been in Jiljage, Muni Yang, Montreal. Um, it's gone by in a quick silver fashion, uh, but I want to welcome us into this space from my position as a settler educator, an uninvited guest on unceded Indigenous lands. Uh, the lands have been recognized as, or uh, the Ganyagahaga, I should say, have been recognized as the custodians of this land. And I'm traveling and working and inviting you to this gathering with my connection to Concordia, but also um, from my homelands. Um, I'm from Treaty 1 Manitoba, which is southern Manitoba, which is the traditional lands of the Oji Cree, uh, the Cree, as well as the Dene, Dakota, and the home heartland of the Red River Métis Nation. And whilst we're gathered across digital spaces and in-person spaces, um, I want to make this part of the conversation. Uh, Paul, you are joining us from? I'm, I'm, I'm joining from Montpellier, south of France. Uh -huh. Montpellier, so in a different time zone. Uh, we're going to talk <laughs> a little bit about separation, connection, and transmission, but you are at the moment on the other side of the Atlantic in a different time zone and in a different body space. It's midnight mm -hmm. your time. Uh, so we are especially grateful for you staying up, <laughs> although maybe, you know, this is a, a, a golden hour of <laughs> discussion, um, but we are all coming into this space from different energies and spaces and times and, and matter. Um, I also want to draw on a connection to someone who um, maybe is in the webinar, but it's the, the curator who's worked with Paul um, over the past, well, years, in fact, uh, Chloe, uh, who is the curator and director at Diagonal. I have a few remarks prepared to uh, bring to attention Diagonal. Um, it was established in 2004. Um, I know some of you have been to their newer space in the Maya Lens. Uh, some have also been able to spend time with Paul's work. 
as the days move into nights, which is on show until the 22nd of October. So if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, uh, you'll be able to go there uh, and bring some of the tentacles of this conversation with your visit. Uh, Diagonal is a center of dissemination of contemporary art located in the heart of Mile End. Um, it's it, it involves an annual presentation program of exhibitions and residencies. This is a mixture of residency for research as well as production and conferences centered around its mandate. Uh, this upholds or unfolds within the artistic um, and theoretical projects of various artists, curators, um, and theoreticians who strive to think with matter, concept, and referentiality. Uh, so that is the closing of my remarks, and I'm going to hand over to my co-host, uh, Jubina, who is going to introduce Paul. Um, and then I'll come back onto the video because Paul uh, and I had a discussion about the way things would unfold for this quote unquote artist talk, and we are going to be in informal conversation. Uh, so you'll see my face again in a moment, and it's over to you, Jubina. Thanks so much. Okay. Hello. Uh, in, I have to lower this. Hello, introducing for tonight's Sika talk, Paul Maheki, born in 1985 in La Brive le Gallard, France. He is represented by the Gallery Sultana and the Goodman Gallery. And within his practice, he mainly does installation and performance. His main subject matter is blackness and queerness. He was also shortlisted for Future Generation Art Prize in 2021. And Meheki was also in residence at Diagonal in August 2022. And his work still lingers despite his departure. And introducing Paul Meheki. Thank you for that co-hosting, Jabina. Um, how are you feeling, Paul? Good, good. Um, yeah, it's like I think I'm still on the time zone of um, Montreal, <laughs> so it's still okay. Yeah, looking forward to tonight's conversation. Good. Well, shall we situate ourselves in the space of the work that is down the street? Uh, well, a bit further down the street, but in Myland, in Diagonal. Mm -hmm. um, as the days move into nights, uh, some of folks in the audience have spent time with this work already, but for those who haven't, uh, let's bring in some images, uh, let's bring in some reflections, some memories, some energies uh, that you've you've left in that space for us. Yeah, um, I can share my screen actually with a couple of, uh, more than a couple actually, uh, of images that I took before leaving. So these are not like the official, <laughs> documentations but more so like pictures that I took from my iPhone which actually can be also interesting <laughs> mm. um, because I'm like um, very interested in working with like ideas of composition uh, sketching and drawing that we talked about with Maya a little bit and this show is um, kind of a reflection of that as well in some sense so I mostly work with performance um, installation but I'm also drawing a lot drawing actually has been like part of my practice for the longest time um, but it's maybe an aspect that people are maybe less familiar with mm -hmm. uh, because the work that I've like made in the last like let's say six seven years where um, that were made more visible where the, the works where I started to kind of like work with dance um, but actually like drawing holds a very specific place in my in my thinking my artistic thinking as well as like writing um, and so the show um, that was supposed to happen in 2020 early 2020 had of course to be postponed because of covid mm -hmm. um, but was following an invitation of Chloe Brondeau, the, the director of Diagonal, um, back in 2018. And she had the idea of kind of me staying a longer time, a longer for a longer period of time to in order to develop like some of the works that I would be showing in the space, as well as maybe um, kind of creating a performance uh, that would take place there. Um, and I was really excited about that because Montreal is a city actually in which I lived in for like a couple of years um, 
in the early year 2010, yeah, 2011, 2013, I think. So I was really always happy to come back. Um, and this show is kind of like, has evolved a lot from the moment when we started to talk with Chloe, I think where um, she was mostly interested in in exhibition projects where I was kind of like looking at water as a, as a, almost like as a feminist matter or as a thinking matter. There's something that is very important as well in my thinking, this kind of like um, trying to break away from the hierarchy between nature and culture and, and what thinks and what does. And so trying to articulate the things and often um, this materializes in objects that are of various natures um, as always, and there's always like multiple stories behind them, um, but that you don't have necessarily to know about uh, or not knowing all of them. That's something that is so very important for me that we can approach my shows in a very um, sensitive way. Um, and so there's also a huge kind of, um, role of sound and light and colors um, in, in the thing that I'm developing and, and showing. And so here is no exception for that show. At Diagonal, I was uh, kind of like started to think about how color could um, kind of literally like compose some sort of landscape in the space for the work to kind of be inscribed in. And this landscape is very, autobiographical because it's based mm. on measures of my body actually this is something that maybe that is not necessarily communicated on but that is part of the the thinking um and I'm always when I'm I'm kind of like looking at what it means to represent yourself and to be in this like idea of self-portraiture how to we think of those representation as an extension towards other selves or other um other not facets but other um avatars almost or like kind of okay. yeah other other selves basically um and actually I have to say like often I say that my work is not necessarily about blackness or about queerness that's something that actually I'm kind of like more and more are reluctant to say it's more that my work is made out of um those elements so my work is inherently queer and black and so um, this is as, as well for me a way to kind of like liberate myself from um, maybe some frameworks that are attached to identity politics that I don't necessarily like recognize myself in um and identity politics have played a huge and very important role um at a certain moment in time, and maybe that is less of a reflection of like um, the generation of artists that I'm part of, where things are a bit maybe more like are going like yeah, kind of not against, but kind of in a, looking at things like from more of a critical point of view and trying to offer um, some sort of like space for dreaming for fantasy maybe but not necessarily in a romantic way um mm -hmm. and i often speak about like this idea of creating like mini kind of like cosmologies or mini environments or universes that are somehow like utopian but a form of utopia that would kind of acknowledge its flaws and its um limitations that's very important for me mm -hmm. and um this exhibition is also speaking from that point of view because the starting point is embedded in like journal entries that are wrote during the, the pandemic that were first like never meant to go public because they were kind of like trying like a tool for me to understand um, uh, an abuse that I've been suffering of like in the past relationship and kind of like it was my way to kind of understand and, and comprehend what happened and so to articulate that but quickly it became something else that had to do with like understanding what we mean when we use terms such as like vulnerability or resilience um, in the political context and in the context of COVID as well where 
our social interaction and very much in the same way as I experienced the abuse were becoming the site of a form of violence, basically, because of the potential of this like mm -hmm. daily agent um, that would kind of, uh, yeah, and then just certain people and put an emphasis on how inequal um, and how unbalanced um, our society is. Mm. Thank you for for sharing that that context, Paul. And it's there there are so many questions that are permeating in my mind that we've discussed in the past um, that I'd love for us to to welcome the the audience into. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them is the the distinction that you make about about bodily presence and making work from a particular position, and the. Uh, performance that you you shared with us uh, for those of um, who could be in the space so much depended upon your proximity to mm -hmm. other audience members using that energy in the space but then there are these other elements that you articulate as not being immediately legible to some visitors to the space particularly the dimension of the creation of the show having some dimensions of your body um, would you be willing to talk a little bit about how you make those decisions as a dancer, performance artist, for somebody who's coming from a position with language and presence, mm -hmm. uh, what that unfolding is like for you? Um, for me, yeah, this relationship between the audience and the performer is actually central to um, why I started performing or why I started to kind of make different types of works after rapidly after I graduated from my MA in 2011, when I was mostly doing drawings and installation, I got really, really bored actually in the last two years of my master's. And uh, and I wanted to do, to think about like, a, like some artistic forms that were not necessarily like dependent on certain type of spaces, as in like the white cube um, and certain type of audiences. So I started to kind of experiment with actions that were happening and taking place in public space but um were completely dedicated to like an unaware audience or a very small audience and I think like that's really something that kind of resonated with me um in my experience of the world where actually I started to kind of create works that were specifically dedicated to certain people and whether I would say it or not um that the address is still there and that's something that actually I think I borrowed also from the thinking of like Felix Gonzalez Torres and so when I started to perform myself at the time like those first actions um actually some of, of which like took place in Montreal um were only revealed like years after like maybe three or four years after when I was like first invited to actually show some remains or documentation of those actions and when um, there was a very brutal moment when I was kind of invited to take part in I was selected in this show that is kind of a survey of like a new generation of artists in France and it's happening every year and so my image my body was completely absent of those works and when I was met with like some journalists art people um, viewers there were some reflections made to the, you know, made um, in response to those images that were not like, as someone told me, the reflection of like the work of a black artist or of an African artist. And so I started to kind of like try to question this because this is an aspect that I was like really struck by. What it is? What is the work of a black artist? What how how it should look like? Um, and then that's when I started to be rather than like like fleeing away from that like really trying to wrestle with this and and put myself in situations where my body would be present my image would be present my identity was so made clear and then it was kind of like a first step for me to um introduce myself on my own terms and so right away the the, the performance or when I, whenever i started to use performance i also started to use dance because that's something that it's kind of a career that I entertained having like when I was a teenager and then I kind of quit when I, I um, joined like my first art school. Um, 
And dance was kind of like a way for me to shake up the space, but also to shake up the bodies and to um, that were kind of like witnessing those dances. Um, and that's kind of like, that could only happen in close proximity with the audience. And that's something that I was really interested in. And often I have people all around me and that's the position that I kind of like, like to have. And there's often moments in the performance where I'm trying to shift, you know, this kind of like typical relationship between a performer and an audience and this kind of like mass of bodies versus like a singular body and how to kind of break away from, again, like the power dynamic that can take place in that. So um, even though I don't necessarily use participation per se, it's not necessarily like a tool or strategy that I'm interested in, but I'm definitely engaging in a dialogue that sometimes is very direct with people. And for example, in Montreal, um, in the performance that I've shown, um, some part of it were also was also like improvised in the moment in response to the amount of people in the room. And so I started to lean on, on bodies, like started to talk to people. And, and that's often like a, a shift that I like to operate because that's kind of like, a way to share a responsibility of taking care of that space, of taking care of each other in this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you spoke a little bit about the improvisation um, in that performance. And it was part of the, the a question I had related to this idea of, of presence and how much mm -hmm. of a performance scenario you bring as a determined choreography that you are... Um, have a clear intention of 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 acting out um or if there's the improvisation with audience members and for those who weren't at the performance last week on the 8th of September um the room was was full uh mm. it was part of a series of openings at the guest bay building and i myself hadn't been in a performance space that was so full of bodies since before mm. 2019 or 2020 um and you you said the word proximity and it almost I mean would you say it almost became a material in the room because of maybe the embodied experience of being in a live moment like that in such proximity to one another but mm -hmm. then how you were deciding to almost like draw circuits through the assembled bodies and in fact maybe touch them Mm -hmm. or speak to them as you were saying some masked some not what was yeah. what was that energy like for you um for that specific performance so it's it's very strange because like and it's a bit cliche but whenever I perform I'm in this really weird zone where um it's almost like I have to become something else or someone else so mm -hmm. uh, I often talk about like this idea of channeling uh in a way and so in those moments, it's very hard for me to kind of like, for example, I didn't see you or what, it's very hard for me to kind of like see who is in the audience, but um, definitely more focusing on what is the energy circulating and what I really enjoy feeling is like how this energy can shift and we can kind of like move together almost like in a way that a wave would form um and so and that's kind of like those words where and the sounds um that were played by Drew Barnett who was my collaborator for this iteration of the of the performance um were kind of like sending ripples that were that I could witness in the audience and um, and that's something that in terms of improvisation, I would say, and it's almost like in in that case, I wouldn't necessarily speak about improvisation, but more like as a form of response or call and response. So I'm throwing something into into the audience, and the audience is kind of like sending it back, and it became almost like a form of like collective meditation. Um, and I was also part of it. I was leading it maybe, um, but I was also kind of like part of this kind of meditative moment so um for me it's kind of like those are really moments of research these are very much um for me an opportunity to kind of like look at the work and look at what i'm producing in a different way and to kind of like expose it to an audience and seeing how this is received 
And so it's it's very, um, yeah, it's something that I missed during COVID in a way, um, because even though I discovered that I was maybe a bit more introvert, more of an introvert than I, I think I was, or I thought I was, I still, in the context of my work and in context, especially of the performance, need that kind of like surrounding audience. I think that's really what is interesting in me um, and interesting me in the, the performative space. And it's maybe less about making images than like creating some sort of like communal experience. And so definitely like, I think um, these energies or this tension between me and the audience um, and the numbers as well, like of people, um, are definitely becoming like a, a form of like material for for the work to exist. Mm. The I, I'd love to travel with that word surrounding just for a moment. Um, the surrounding of of people and presence, mm. but you also um, have spoken about and um, have hosted conversations where you're talking about presence that isn't physically in a space. Mm -hmm. uh, so transmissions through cosmos, um, ghosts and rhythms of ancestors. And I would invite us to start perhaps with language, uh, mm -hmm. language as a material that can surround us um, and that you can work with as a material. Um, what, do, do you view language as, as a material? Um, definitely. Um, and that's something that actually it took me a long time to kind of like actually exhibit or even publish the text that I was writing um, or that I were, yeah like the thing that I was producing in writing and then it's always alongside dance it's always been part of like from the very beginning of me performing for audiences, it's it, text and words have always been part of this. Um, and I think like, I don't know, it, it's kind of like, I, I, I use a lot of references like in my work, but they're not necessarily like, for me, it's less of a way to situate the work than it is for me to find like, to resonance or to enter in resonance with other thinkers. And, and, and I think in that terms, like, in that way, sorry, um, words are, are also, yeah, becoming like a, um, some sort of like a, a material because like, for example, when you said that, like I started to think about Gil Kengem and this French writer wrote a lot about like gay imagination in the Paris of the seventies um, that describes like language that we tend to forget that language is only the container of the universe or a form of container. And I think that's really important. Like there's definitely things that words can do and things that they can't. And I think like, that's very important for me to keep this tension between what is being said, what is being written, what is, you know, um, or vocalized in a space and what also happens outside of this. And so, forms of communication that are non-verbal for example and that's where like drums and rhythm is super important for me vibrations and and resonances because they are affecting us um physically in in what you know like kind of like the water inside of our body our bones um are responding to it or are receivers of that and i think that's like a something that is often present in the sun, the sound element are accompanying the works. Um, but it's also something that I was thinking of, especially during COVID, like it's kind of like how to um, experiment with a form of touch that is kind of like not about physical contact or mm. that has to do with something else. And, um, and there's my interest also in anything that has to do with like, you know the the esoteric the ghost um the ghost as as a natural like um thing as well as like a political figure a metaphor that's something that is like very important for me because it's kind of like the ghost is a very interesting type of trope and being um that doesn't necessarily like 
fit well with binary. So it's um it's I, I say that it's like there's always an agency with the idea of the ghost because the ghost can decide to appear to some and not to others, um, can decide to appear or not appear at all, can also live between different dimensions, different frequencies, can speak to the idea of the past, the present, the future. Um and and always in this kind of like very interesting um, movement oscillating between the visible and the invisible. Mm. Yeah, I, I appreciate the the point you make about the agency of ghosts and spirits and spectral presences, and I'm connecting that to again this word of surround, uh, like mm -hmm. when you're in a performance space or in a bodied space with other entities that there's a hospitality perhaps at hand um, and a ghost can uh, d like has the agency to appear or be present or, or not mm -hmm. and to manifest that presence in different ways. Um, would you be willing to talk a little bit about how you set up that space of the performance, maybe particularly with reference to light and sound as a form of language? Mm -hmm. um, so for the one in, in Montreal, it was rather simple. It was just like, um, yeah, it was rather simple in terms of light and sound, and I wanted to keep it that way because this work was more of a like a sketch or like a kind of a, a try, me trying something mm -hmm. out, like some materials that I've been like toying with in my mind and that I wanted to see uh, manifest in a space. Um, so in that sense, it was like in Montreal, it was very kind of like traditional. The lighting was doing what the lighting generally usually does and the sound as well and and on top of that it was music so that was kind of like um a very specific approach to sound however by the past i've been also working with sound and light almost as kind of like um other performers on stage and so for example there is this work that i created in 2019 between 2018 and 2019 um, and that was shown a little bit like in, in Europe and in the US. Um, that was called Senza and I had two collaborators with me. I created this work with two friends of mine. One is Nkisi and she's a um, Belgo-Congolese uh, DJ and music producer, musician and um, kind of sound genius. And then a friend of mine called Ariel Efraim Majbel, who is a theater director and also a lighting designer. And the three of us wanted to kind of like create a work where the body almost wouldn't necessarily be like the, the main character of the mm -hmm. work. So giving agency to the building by placing some, like for example, mics that would pick up on the sound of the audience, all the vibrations in the walls, and then that would be kind of like processed by Melika Sunkisi and um, re-injected live like into the, the soundtrack, also creating some sort of like systems where we couldn't necessarily control what the light would be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and working with light in a way that was less about like, sh yeah, shining a light on a body or making a body visible in a black space, but rather like trying to find also an another language around that. So how the light could go against that and actually kind of invisibilize or me or even like take over me. And, and then the, the center of that was not like um, my physical presence, but it became something else. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's uh, yeah. an example I can give, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can build up to sharing the, the video that we have queued. Yeah. And I think it's a great example of how um, light in proximity to the body can be, at the one hand, like a, an invitation to notice, a spotlight, if you will, which is yeah. often gallery lighting that we expect to experience. But yes. it also can be... Uh, um, an obs like an, it can be obscure like there obscure, are things that yeah. happen in the shadow and that is also an invitation for that that movement yeah um, that's, so yeah if i can say just two words about that because that's true it's actually like i didn't even think about that the video but it's actually like a follow-up to that work that was a performance called senza and this one um is a is a video work that i presented in ukraine uh last year actually it's crazy to think that like september exactly around that time um and the sound has been produced by um 
uh, studio of sound designers and that was the first time that I was kind of like working in that way um, and thinking about sound as also a tool for um, the choreography but also like the the storytelling and you'll see and the lighting is kind of like I the few instructions that I gave to the to the studio and the 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 DOP was the idea that I wanted to replicate almost like the phenomenon of an eclipse um, and so mm. the idea of like the obscuring celestial body mm -hmm. yeah and the invitation to think of the celestial body mm -hmm. as in the cosmos but also the corporal yes okay. yeah uh, maybe that is a welcome cue to Jean-Francois to please start the video and we'll play it for a few minutes from the beginning. Thank you.
There's a moment of applause starting in the room. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Uh, thank you for for sharing that that video with us. Um, can I ask a question about the dressing of of your body in some of your performance work, um, particularly in the video that you just shared? There's the contrast of the white and black with the lighting and the spotlighting mm -hmm. that we were talking about. Uh, but there is also um, uh, sorry, there's some pop-ups on the screen that have distracted me. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's also a mixture of of like cultural references in clothing, the the sports Adidas shorts, um, the do rag that you're wearing, and also the the shirts. It makes me think of. Um, I was reading like nautical strings and perhaps sails into some of <laughs> its construction. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about the decisions you're making of dressing the body for performance moments. Yes, for that video, it's actually um, I've worked with. Um, a stylist that then recommended a uh, fashion designer, very young fashion designer based in London, uh, called Fier Firpal Jawanda. And Firpal is um, a very interesting maker because they are only working with like recycled material that they've inherited from their family. Um, they are of Pakistani descent. So all the fabrics that they've been working with for that collection that was actually part of their degree show, um, I believe were brought from uh, Pakistan to the UK in like, um, I, I can't remember how you call them, like, but big trunks that um, their mom and aunts came with um, while immigrating in the UK. And so there was this idea of kind of like mixing together um, different things so with Kirkley Thomas the 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 stylist um we kind of like worked on this kind of like mixture of um, very kind of like recognizable um pieces of clothing that also are the function like for example I'm wearing knee pads because in the performance at some point I need them but they were so part of like kind of like bringing some sort of like um imagination so which each item there is something that is kind of like borrowing from like a very kind of concrete reality and so the durag has been also um kind of an element that was um important for me like in the last couple of years as a as a so like a social signifier and what it represents what it became as well like um in pop culture but as well as like more of its like ancient origins in um, ancient ethiopia so um, there is this kind of like idea that the government is kind of like also bringing the work somewhere in terms of like geographies, in terms of like um, also imaginations that are very much like diasporic in a way, um, which is kind mm -hmm. of also something that I'm kind of like interested in like thinking about. Um, so yes, that's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps another way of adding to this notion of, of language or mm -hmm. the, the explanatory comma, people will see that recognition um, and be welcomed into that that space and that, that history and positionality. Um, I would love for maybe us to talk a little bit about um, not only your, your uh, work as a performance artist, but also maybe facilitator and collaborator. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that this work was also done with uh, with Drew Barnett, who was on the drum kit in the performance last week. Mm -hmm. uh, was also singing and carrying some language um, mm -hmm. in his body with you, and you've performed in so many different spaces. Um, the Highline in New York, which is a particular kind of of space, sometimes outside, mm -hmm. but also has its nooks of artistic framing. Um, in artist-run centers, but also in galleries. So would you be willing to talk a little bit about how you facilitate collaborative work and the trust building and the invisible labor that goes into that? Yeah, that's very important, actually. Um, collaboration is, is key to how I think and to how I make, and that's very important for me to kind of like acknowledge that in um, as a like um, another aspect of um, my practice um, and often the collaborations can be actually like a way 
for me to use my work as a as a meeting point and so um, it's often starting from like a, almost like a carte blanche and maybe sometimes I have ideas about how and how and why I want to bring certain people in but often these are people who also have their own practice that I'm interested in and I'm interested in kind of bringing some elements of their practice into mine um, so again this idea of kind of like a meeting point and this like yeah porosity is very important for me in the case of like most of my collaboration are quite long term actually um or even with my family I've collaborated yeah. with my father with my siblings that are not artists or working in the art but uh, I managed to find ways to kind of like um make it happen but in the case of Drew it was more of a of a call out for a musician and actually at first I was interested in maybe working with someone that could play a brass instrument or a wind instrument and um, when I received the material of Drew who is mostly like a guitar player and a, and a drum player like a, a drummer sorry um I, I kind of like, yeah, instantly kind of like was interested in what it was doing with sound and music and composition. And so I reached out and then we we had a couple of days together in the space to kind of like build this work. Mm -hmm. So I had already like all of the textual aspect, like textual material was already uh, ready. But then um, when it came to sound, it was very much like a dialogue into like, um, what I'm, uh, what I was interested in, and what uh, what Drew was also interested in, and and how this idea of like kind of resonance was very prevalent, um, and um, and so and then the singing came along um, with this vocalization that was present on the soundtrack that is actually playing in the in the show that is like um, performed by me, and then we kind of like try to yeah harmonize together there was this idea of kind of like point of connections because for example in the rest of the performance you could feel that we were maybe on like two parallel lines and a way to kind of like make them um meet was kind of like through this idea of harmonizing or tuning to one another um through um like those kind of vocalizations I wouldn't call it singing for myself but like mm. this kind of like way again of like and um, entering in a dialogue that is not about the words mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and the uh the frequencies and the call and response mm -hmm. I thought were very um you could feel it in in the room of the sound enveloping bodies and then ricocheting in the space um the the other talking point I'd love to um to share with folks is something that you and I spoke about um uh last week at some stage mm -hmm. and that is the uh the temporality of of your work um and the potential for things to be in orbit or maybe like cycling mm -hmm. uh, so on the one hand that relates to what you were just uh, offering us about um the call and response and the the sound uh of a space but then also carrying a thread across works and sometimes returning mm -hmm. to past works that may be um, bringing in self-portraits of yourself, um, things that have been part of performances, sculptural mm -hmm. items, language that you've been carrying with you, not only as a choreography in your body, but also maybe text that you bring onto the walls. And you use this very particular term of the, of the sketch. Mm -hmm. um, so I would love for us, and then we can maybe open it up to the folks in the room and online, uh, to talk a little bit about the sketch as as process um, mm -hmm. in, in your work and drafting of work. Yeah, it's like, it's even more, um, maybe also interesting to think about like the sketch, the rehearsal, um, mm -hmm. and the attempt as as like maybe synonyms in, in how I'm going to speak because that's an attempt at, uh, of mine of kind of like trying to, to think about how do we exhibit a practice versus how do we create images so for me like even when it comes to drawing and or it comes to objects 
or performances, I really like to think about those things that are not fixed and they can exist in one space in one way and they can just like travel and evolve and be repurposed um elsewhere and i think like that's um that's something also that's the way i work i really work by like phases and then things like one thing is like bringing another and and so on and and i really like this idea of a loop that would kind of with each repetition would also be different, come back different. Um, and that's a bit an idea also like tied to this idea, yeah, to the cosmos and um, to orbiting, to the practice of orbiting. So um, for me, like, for example, this performance with Drew, although I call it like a sketch, it, it is a work, like it is a proposition. And for me, I don't see it as a lesser, of a lesser <laughs> value because that's kind of like how I wanted it to exist. And maybe the idea of a sketch was more um, to reinforce this idea that things shouldn't be fixed. And both Drew and I, we spoke about it a lot because like in both our practice, like we have attempted that several times, but it is nerve wracking. It's actually like very hard to, for example, um, rehearse in public for me or like to mm -hmm. have people witnessing me trying stuff out live it is it is very very hard um but that's something that actually like I really believe in and that maybe I'm very interested in again like um and going against this idea of like making image so this idea of like an image being something that would be fixed but that is up for debate because um, I also can think of images that that can have this quality of kind of uh, evolving and um, and becoming something else. Mm. In that sense, with the I, and I I agree with you. There can be the both and of something being mm. a sketch as well as a finished work. Um, and because we've been talking about the transmission of <clears throat> of energies and conveyance. Are there are there instances of moments where you've intended or planned on having uh, an item um, or sound frequency like reflections and of, of unresolved shadows, which is in mm. the show at Diagonal, um, has like a, a sonic component that is very much about receiving transitions and vibrations. Um, are there moments where you think, okay, no, actually this isn't for this space and there's a withholding decision that you make? Yes, and I believe that even sometimes the work is deciding for me. Sometimes <laughs> some works refuse to arrive to certain places or sometimes they refuse to, <laughs> um, to work in a certain space and I really trust that. So... Um, I never, I, I try never to force or to enforce something onto the space, as well as like, it's the same with the performance. I'm not interested in, in, in enforcing something to onto the, the people who are witnessing the work. So um, yes, definitely that's like, and I think that's why it was really nice also to be able to spend a month in Montreal um, mm. with access to the gallery, like pretty much 24 hours seven. And so, things could kind of like exist in the way they should exist in this space yeah and of mm. course it's like I mean it's a very romantic way to frame it but there's of, of also like you know restrictions in terms of like budget and what you can do and also like just time and resources but mm. um but for me yeah I really do believe that like and for example one aspect of yeah some aspect of the installation was supposed to be different and stuff and I, I decided to kind of like change it and I think that's yeah that's that's also what makes like an exhibition for me a moment of research mm, yeah yeah absolutely I wrote down and drew circles around some works refuse because mm -hmm. that on the one hand is a very poetic claim but it's also a very important reality uh in mm -hmm. an artistic practice especially with so many logistics at hand uh, as we travel to different spaces to be in residence um, and depend on the time and attention of other people which definitely. is a segue sorry go ahead no no definitely okay. and, and also like mm -hmm. being very aware as an artist of like the context of in which you are showing that's that's mm -hmm. often 
what kind of dictates the kind of work that I'm showing or the kind of like performances that I'm creating. It's really very much with an awareness or an attempt to be very aware of where I'm showing to who I'm showing. Mm -hmm. Well, on, on that note, Paul, shall we open up the conversation yeah. to receive questions from people either on the Zoom or in the room proper? Um, if there are folks in the webinar who wish to ask a question, uh, we can use the space of the Q&A. Um, and Pascal, who is uh, moderating, will let me know if there's a question and either she can voice it or I can help. Um, there is a functionality of the webinar for people to raise their hand and be invited to uh, to come into the space. So if you would like to do that, maybe just put it at the beginning of your question and we can do the tech gymnastics to make that happen so we can so you can enter into the room. Um, but before we then mobilize, so it's a bit of a like <laughs> cue to start thinking of your questions. Paul, do you have any questions for us? We talked about this possibility um, that you know some people have been in the performance space. Mm -hmm. Um, we've been um, with you during this conversation. Do you have questions that you'd like to bring in? And now I'm blanking. <laughs> I had some. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I think a question that I'm, uh, I'm always drawn to is kind of like the one of the experience of a space and um, what it is to be like. A member of the audience when um, um, when a work can be yeah like as intimate as as the one that I for example like decided to display at, at diagonal I have a, a roaming microphone for anybody that wants to share or communicate their experience of the performance last week, if you were there. We're also happy to bring in responses from our webinar audience. Oh, and I should add, um, I'll mask myself as I'm coming through the audience. Okay, maybe we can hang on a few minutes to see if there's responses bubbling up and then we'll come to you, Martin, with your question. See, the audience isn't used to being asked questions. Yeah. Isn't that an interesting social practice? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be gossipy, but I do also. Um, uh, I have this habit when watching or being in the space with performance art of watching or paying attention to how other people in the space are receiving the mm -hmm. performance. So it's sort of like a meta, like I'm watching. Yeah taking in what you're doing, but then seeing like, how are other people responding? And um, there was this, there was a very interesting mixture of behavioral responses to you coming into the audience's space and sort of breaking that divide of body performing audience watching. Mm -hmm. um, and there were like, there was always a careful attempt to make space for you mm -hmm. and to, make sure that you could expand um, and take up whatever space you needed to do what you were about to do. So my question is, because you've you've done, um, I guess I'm volleying back the question to you, Paul, uh, because you've done performances across so many different cultural geographies, uh, what, what kind of responses do you, do you expect or anticipate or then like improvise off of? Um, I rarely expect certain like responses or I really come in with an idea of how the audience may react actually. Um, 
I but I can I definitely attest that there is like very um yeah a, a range of reactions that um sometimes can be really um unsettling or like that can really like throw you off but that's also interesting that's also what like kind of the work does and as soon as you invite and you extend yourself to a public then you know you're like up to against like a lot of things most of the time people are very um kind of like well intended and 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 also caring um so that is kind of like also a nice and what I described is kind of like what I felt um, at Diagonal was very much this idea of like a wave against which I could lean in or I could go against as well. And so I think that's, 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 that was quite interesting. Also because the audience for, um, like it's, it's, it was rare, but for example, there was my mom in the audience and, and she's rarely, she was rarely able to see my work. So that was kind of like quite special. There were also friends that are not really up related that came in. So that's also adding a layer of, um, of, uh, of, I guess, like affectivity, or I don't know, there's something that has to do with like the affect, um, but I, yeah, I rarely expect people to kind of have a specific reaction. It's, and it's the same with like the physical works with like the, the static work. I don't expect people to kind of like take away one specific thing when they see the show. Um, I'm very much interested in this dialogue, um, you know, by proxy <laughs> with my work between me and my work and between the audience and my work and therefore also between me and the audience. Mm -hmm. I appreciate is it working? Yes. Um, I appreciate that openness to have a set of conditions to which people can respond as they feel comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. I also want to add that there was a small child uh, next to me during the performance who was maybe four years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's such a, I, I, that's such a, an interesting context added to anything that is performance-based. Um, I think because you don't always know how people are going to respond and the mm -hmm. questions that come forward. Um, and the child um, who was there was asking a lot of questions about why is he doing this and what's happening now? Because of course you couldn't see and then wanted to go play the drums. Uh, so that idea of like what is allowed or not in a space um, yeah. is is became also palpable just because mm -hmm. I was next to that child and I was also thinking oh that's a good question like <laughs> why can't you go play the drums and what would that then do to the performance moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's um, that yeah that's really interesting. I think like that's kind of like um, also something that I I was able to witness in like different. Yeah, cultures where all spaces, all audiences that were very different, and um, most of the time I'm I'm performing to kind of like art audiences, but um, I've been I found myself in situations where yeah, like uh, the setup that I created was kind of inviting all kind of like energies, good or bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there's a question here from Martin, who is an artist and also part of the grad program here in Montreal, Jojage. I'm going to pass you the microphone. Are you okay with the mic? Yeah. Great. Hi, Paul. Uh, thank Hi. you for being here with us and showing us your practice. I have uh, a long, there's so many things I wrote down um, because your practice is very, very robust. Um, but I think I'm going to go off on this uh, I'm also a performer, and so I'm interested to hear, and we kind of touched on this briefly, um, like, and I, unfortunately, I was there at the performance, but was called away, so I, I had to leave right as it started, so I missed some of it, but I'm curious, because I felt that there's like a thirst from the community for performance right now because of COVID and because we don't want to deal with performance through screens, and I'm just curious how, um, like going through the COVID and then performing now in front of publics, how that's changed maybe your your practice as far as like your approach with the audience or with yourself. Is there a reaction that you're going for? Uh, yeah, just. Um, I think really enough after Montreal, in Montreal, I realized that I kind of forgot about COVID. And the next day I was like, wow, I was, <laughs> I was very close to a lot of people and, um, 
and um, I was not very like responsible in that way because also I kind of engage yeah with this kind of like physical contact at some point with some members of the audience without necessarily thinking of like that they could be vulnerable and I could carry the virus without knowing and stuff. So that was an interesting afterthought. But in the moment, weirdly really enough, for that performance, I didn't, I kind of had forgotten about COVID. Um, but I remember like the first performance that I did um, post COVID. So maybe like June 2021, I think was my first one in Scotland. There were very, very strict rules. So the audience had to be like in like, bubbles and they were like kind of like all around me like placed in small groups of people that knew each other um and that was a very different energy because I was kind of like also because the space was quite big um and in the dark so I was performing to like blackness <laughs> to darkness literally um and I, I I was also kind of like interested in this in the context of that work because there was a way of working that I'd never really engage with really um that is actually maybe a bit more traditional in that sense where you have a, a space like kind of like dedicated to a performer and another space dedicated to the um the audience and, and it's kind of like this look from like the outside in um but I think like it's definitely um emphasize my interest in what it means to be in contact what it means to kind of like also expose yourself to um almost like this kind of like yeah form of contamination whether it be like the virus but also I'm thinking in more metaphorical terms maybe like when I when I use for example copper and acid in, in some other works of mine there is this reaction that is created by the encounter between the acid and, and the metal and that creates something um, and I think that was kind of like weirdly enough COVID has been a relief a little bit at some point like not to have to perform not to have to be in a space but also to kind of like redefine um, my relationship to performing and this idea of like the presence and having to be present in the space then I realized my practice was so dependent of that on that and so whenever I perform now I think it's it's like rarer um, that I kind of like um, go to performance and what it is when I'm interested in in the performative I think it's like with a, a lot more intent or a lot more reflection about what it means to be present in the space. Thanks for that, um, that question, Martin. And Paula, I suppose it adds another layer to the, the, um, the term transmission that we've been mm -hmm. talking about, transmission mm -hmm. and something being viral um, mm -hmm. and how that travels through proximity and it's a reality that we're now living with and part of mm -hmm. part of a embodied practice. Um, the next question comes from Kelly, who is a member of our faculty here. I'm going to pass the microphone. Hello, Paul. Um, I was drawn to this. I, I wasn't at the performance, um, but I'd, I'd like to ask the question about what the role of the textiles are in your work because I was very much taken by the poster image and also then the video that we saw tonight. And, but I have no idea what you were um, um, wearing or performing in for um, this talk that, this performance that we've had a lot of talk about. Um, mm -hmm. So could you, you know, textiles bring their own inherent meaning and associations and choices. So, um, Perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit about that aspect of your work. Um, yeah, textiles have been also an important kind of part of the vocabulary that I kind of developed uh, through the use of curtains, for example, onto which I was kind of like printing texts. And the first time that I did that was really like to kind of like use the curtains at the very um, functional object that would kind of filter the light through, but then as well as a, a an excuse almost to exhibit my text. And when I started to work with those curtains, for example, that was around like 2015, 2016, 
um, the idea was to kind of like, yeah, kind of play on, on this idea of like an object that is so tied to the domestic realm um, and therefore is kind of like addressing the body in this very direct way because it is made like um, in its proportion, in its function, in relationship to body without necessarily like representing one. Um, and then I used other ways like textile and curtains with in other ways in other shows where uh, it had to do more with like this idea of like a, a porous membrane that would kind of like filter through as well like as retaining some some other things without necessarily like fixing or um stopping things from entering the exhibition space that's so, something that I kind of used to articulate my relationship to um or my attempt to kind of like acknowledge the difficulties of like exhibit like what's left in a space and what's left out um, and whether it is like more of a um physical you know like um philosophical space or an actual like physical space like how to embody like very abstract concept into a, a concrete space and textiles have, and garments have been helping me to do that because as you said they come with a set of like um you know stories and a certain load as well um in the performance of montreal i was dressed as as i wanted to be dressed for the opening um so it it, it was less of a like of a, of a costume or something that i thought about in relationship to the performance um but it's often the case i have often in the performance work i wear specific clothes that i'm interested in because they are referencing to um something or some figures that i want to bring in um and most of the time these as well are ghosts because i don't necessarily like talk about it in the performance or the performance is not necessarily about that but i want them to be present Um, what we wear to the vernissage and opening is also a costume. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> definitely, definitely. Uh, but I, I like that the the curtains were brought into the conversation because it, as a in this case, for, for the show that we saw images of, they were a support for text and language. And the way it ripples, for me anyways, as a reader, made me think that the language was, was malleable also, that it also mm -hmm. ripples. Um, and it, I was thinking of the poetry of Canicia Lebrun, who identifies as a poet who's also dyslexic and sees words as changeable and malleable and movable. And depending on where was, was standing, certain letters in the word were obscured or overlapped. So it was almost like an errant reading of your, your poetry in the curtain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought that was a really nice choice of, of movement of language. Um, we have two more questions. Um, Nora, who's in the audience here, has a question. And then after that, I'm going to go to Pascal, who has a question from our Zoom audience. Are you okay for two more questions, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass the microphone to Nora now. Hi, Paul. Thanks again for staying up late for us. <laughs> um, I've I've been a performer my whole life, really, and um, so I was really uh, curious about your comment um, about performing as channeling, and um, I I was curious about what what it is, or uh, not that it has to be one thing, but it, is there a thing or a range of things or states or characters? that you um, feel that you have channeled during your performances. I certainly understand what that I've channeled very specific narrative type characters or even in, you know, more like postmodern performance, you're sort mm -hmm. of channeling this meta version of yourself or something. So mm -hmm. I understand it can get really abstract, but if you could speak more, a little more to this idea of what are you channeling or what have you channeled in different instances in performance? Thank you. Um, often I call upon my grandmothers, <laughs> one that I've known, another one that I have not been able to meet. 
Um, I also call upon uh, my ancestors. That's something that is very important to me. And that's something that I don't actually necessarily share, but that's something that I'm, I'm doing as a practice before performing. So probably some of them are present in this. Then there are, the, according to different works, there are like certain type of like, masculinities that I'm kind of interested in or interest, interested in bringing in because I know that my body can kind of embody them in a certain way um, and then there's other moments where I'm not even aware and then um, of what I'm really channeling I'm really letting myself kind of like be open to the aura of the space but the energy also of the audience um, the music is also something that is kind of like setting me into a certain like space um and so I guess like that's uh, there's a little bit of of that that is kind of like uh, part of what I'm channeling um what I've also realized lately is that the first sport or the the first sport that I, I practiced as a kid was figure skating from age four and Figure skating is all about this kind of like arena um, and this rink where the audience is around. And so maybe, and then you have this like solo performer or duo of performers in the middle of, a, of the rink. And I think like maybe part of me think that maybe like the little figure skater in me was also, is also present in some of the performances. For, for that answer, Paul, and we'll perhaps make this our, our final question. Um, and it's coming from our Zoom audience, from Rehan, who is a former student. Uh, Concordia works quite a bit with ceramic as a material. And I'm going to pass the microphone to Pascal, who will read the question. Hi, Paul. Um, so the question goes as follows. Thank you very much for sharing your practice. It's been very inspiring. Talking about different cosmologies, do you know how your performance is perceived in Congo or other African countries? Have you ever had an experience as such performing in non-Western contexts? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, so as to how my performances are perceived in the Congo, I don't know, because actually the first time that I'm going to exhibit work um, in the Congo is now. <laughs> it, um, the Congo Biennale opened in Kinshasa and they had invited me to present a work that was supposed to be a performance or was supposed to be in Kinshasa now, um, but it couldn't happen. So I'm presenting a video work, so I will let you know later on, but there's definitely um, references to my Congolese heritage in some of the choreographies and kind of like characters that I'm interested in bringing in. Some of the images I'm, I'm interested in bringing in, in terms of the performance. Um, and I've performed in, in non-Western uh, contexts, like in Asia and also in, in the Caribbean and Latin America for very different, yeah, contexts. And my work is also um, like kind of embedded or not embedded, but like as a representation in South Africa, because my, my second gallery is, uh, if South African. Um, and I guess like for me, that it like of course, like it always comes with like a different set of experience and different set of perceptions and references. The work is perceived differently and received differently. But for me, it's like I have to say, like it's less about geographies than it is about the typology of like people and so for example I remember performing on a rooftop like in a village like in the middle of the jungle in um, in Honduras and the, the the event I was invited in uh, was organized by one of the people living in the village and so it was mostly for like farmers and people um yeah living from agriculture and it was like super interesting to see that um how my work could resonate with in this context in a language that I was not uh, in the performance I was not speaking uh, Spanish so there were translators live translators around me and it, it kind of like became something else so I would say it's more about like the kind of typology of people than it is about like um like 
like geographies for me in my experience um yes <clears throat> the the addition of translation to the conversation of transmission mm -hmm. adds a whole nother trajectory um in which we can talk about the the reception of your work and how it how it moves through through the air and waters um but let's maybe leave that for for another time um when maybe we can also welcome you in in person mm -hmm. uh it's been a, an interesting uh hosting of talking about some moments that are very embodied and witnessed uh and then beaming you in spectrally through the zoom mm -hmm. um but it's been it's been nice it hasn't felt like you're removed in any way so i appreciate your your trust especially talking about these these issues when you you can't necessarily see the audience um mm -hmm. so the performativity of the conversation maybe <laughs> is a bit meta <laughs> uh, but i'd really like to thank you paul for for your time and energy and for staying up um under under the moonlight to yeah. to talk with us <laughs> um i'd also like to to thank the people who came along to the talk uh both in the room in the va 114 and also on the zoomosphere uh, Paul has generously agreed for this talk to be recorded, so it will be linkable via the Concordia Conversations in Contemporary Art website and added to our archives of, of discussions. Um, but I would also really like to thank uh, Jubina and Pascal for helping with the co-hosting this evening and Jean-Francois in the tech booth for um, really keeping us on track during Mercury retrograde, uh -huh. which yeah. we're in until the 2nd of October. So uh, let's have a, a moment of, of applause to thanks to everyone's contributions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I will follow up with you, Paul, about extending our, our hospitality to you. Um, and thank you again for, for joining us this evening, Friday night. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shomi. Thank you to everyone I cannot see, but yes, <laughs> it was a pleasure. Smile, smiles and chuckles are rippling through the room. <laughs> so thank you so much, Paul, and have a wonderful rest. Bye-bye. Bye for now.